Okay, so for some reason the pen is not working and uh, we'll just have to write at the blackboard today. So, welcome to the new episode of Contrast Systems. Not sure exactly what episode we are, but we are on the right path, wherever we are. So, what's the point? In the last uh, uh, classes, we've started seeing some interesting things. We got an idea that how control systems works in general, right? So, it takes uh, uh, the, everything that happens uh, around uh, the universe, all the systems, all these dynamical relationships between, between signals, and what does it do? It uh, likes to see the world as blocks, blocks that have inputs and have outputs. And uh, we see that uh, uh, when we describe physical phenomena, well, the, the mathematical uh, descriptions we use to describe these relationships between inputs and outputs or are, are often of, uh, of, of uh, complicated nature, which could be nonlinear, could be all sorts of other classifications that we gave. And, uh, and we said, well, but that's not really of interest to us in this course, because in this course we study linear time invariant systems. And, uh, uh, but we saw that linear time invariant systems actually represent very good approximations of what goes on uh, at nonlinear level in some particular situations called the equilibrium points. So we trusted that this linear time invariant uh, study was something that made sense and, and, and kept us busy, so we proceeded in trying to get a nice mathematical representation of these LTI systems, uh, in particular single input, single output systems. And uh, to do so, we defined this concept of a state variable, which is basically um, this camotage we use to summarize everything that happened since uh, the beginning of time up to some uh, particular time instant that we call an initial condition or a time instant in the past. And the knowledge of this state or state variables um, is useful because, well, as, us, as long as we know these the state variables, which we typically call x, then we can get... Um, and the knowledge of the input signal, the, 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 the stimulus we send it to the system between that time at which the state variables are defined and the current time instant, then we have all the information we need to characterize the system states, evolution, and output, which is what we care about. So we got to what is called the uh, state space representation of a linear time invariant system, which you see uh, in both continuous time and discrete time. In fact, in last class, we said, okay, look, this is how you can write it in, in, in continuous time. Uh, and we looked a little bit at what we called the time response. Now we said, uh, okay, so uh, what do we need to actually find the solution to this uh, set of equations, right? So that x dot equals ax plus bu and y equals a cx plus du, whatever, what, it, what it is, is it's basically a system of first order differential equations, right? So what do you need to solve a system of first order differential equations? You need definitely some initial conditions, you need an input and uh, the knowledge of the system that is a, B, C, D. So we said, okay, how do we figure out the solution? How do we interpret it, most importantly? And, uh, well, these are linear time invariant systems, so we uh, leveraged linearity. And we said, uh, well, we can just find some signals that make sense to us, uh, find what the output of the system is to these independent signals that make sense to us, and then we sum them up, right? Because there is the principle of superposition that works for linear, time, for linear systems. And so we broke the time response into two components, one that depended exclusively on the, um, on the initial conditions and one instead that depended on the, um, on the input, which we can see in discrete time in this first term and second term there. Now we took a step on the side and we said, okay, now we are convinced that we have uh, the evolution of the states or the output can be expressed as uh, uh, two, two components. One is the, um, one is the uh, in free uh, evolution, the one that depends on the initial conditions, and the other one instead is the forced response. It's forced because the input goes and, and drives it, right? So we took a step on the side and said, okay, this is all good, but uh, what if our systems are described, uh, let's say the input signals and the output signals, they are not, they don't work, they don't, they don't exist in continuous time, but rather they are, let's say, um, defined only at specific time instants. Uh, and these, uh, we made the assumption that these time instants were equally spaced in time. They were distant among each other by some constant factor called the sampling period. And we said, okay, now how does everything we set up to now actually change, if at all, uh, in discrete time? So we cranked through a little bit of math and we saw that fundamentally we have the same thing. We can always express 
with the due, of course, nuisances that in discrete time, there's no concept of continuity, of course, so, so you can't do derivatives. We managed to express the um, state space representation of a system as a finite difference set of equations, and it has the same form as the continuous time one, but of course the matrices A, B, C, and D have to be defined in a different way. And we found what the relationships were between the discrete time version and the continuous time version as a function of the sampling time. Now, um, so now we have this, 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 this response, right, of the system. We know that if we feed it to the system an initial condition and an input, we get something, right? And we said, well, control systems really cares about, first of all, keeping things stable, right? So what does stable mean? Stable means that fundamentally, if you send a bounded input to a system, you get a bounded output. That is, things basically, is it me? Yeah? Snooze, my favorite button. It's gonna <laughs> come back up in a few minutes. So anyways, um, don't let me lose the thread here. So what were we saying? We have this response, right? So all good and dandy, but what are we gonna do with the response? We, we wanna make sure, first and foremost, that things don't explode, right? Don't, if you send a, a limited poke, I touch this thing, it doesn't end up on Mars, right? That would be the equivalent of an unstable system, like infinite response movement out of a bounded input. Okay, so, so the question uh, uh, came up uh, kind of naturally. We said, before even getting into how do we control a system, that is, how do we modify its behavior, let's first manage to analyze the behavior. Let's, let's, let's try to find out some, some intuition on uh, how can we evaluate if the response of a system is stable or not. So we saw that we could... Uh, um, we saw that we could, uh, by looking only, can you see the mouse here? Yes, okay. By looking only at the, at the free uh, evolution term, so removing, for, for, for a moment just forgetting about the forced one, pretending the input is equal to zero, we found out this fundamental piece of information that we can tell if a system is stable or not just by looking at the eigenvalues of the A matrix, okay? Where the, eigen, where the A matrix, of course, is the one that relates the evolution of the state variables. And we saw that in continuous time, we had uh, an asymptotically stable system, that is a system that converges to zero given enough time, okay? So it's like perfect, basically. Um, if the real part of every eigenvalue of the A matrix had, uh, was negative, strictly negative, we saw instead that, that it could be uh, still stable in the sense that it would have a bounded output, imagine like a sine wave, a steady state, just keeping its, its constant up and down, doesn't go to zero, but still is bounded. If any of the eigenvalues of the A matrix, in continuous time always, had a real part that was equal to zero. Instead, if we had any, part, any uh, eigenvalue that had a real part that is bigger than zero, then the system would have exploded. And um, similar conditions applied for the uh, discrete time version, where instead we had to look at the uh, magnitude of the eigenvalues, if they were or not inside the unit circle. And how did we get to these conclusions? By noting that actually, um, if one leverages uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix, you can actually diagonalize it. So if you diagonalize it, then you can express the output in a nice form. So first we said, look, hey, we talked about state space representations. Keep in mind that there's as many as you want state space representations. There's infinite, just get your variables x. Define a similarity transformation, and a similarity transformation is a matrix that, that, it, that has an inverse, so you can go back and forth between the different coordinates, points of view. And then you get an equivalent system described like this, where those A, B, and C, and D tilde matrices are the, 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 the same thing as before, but from the new point of view that is in the new coordinates, and the evolutions of the states and the outputs are the same thing here. So we asked ourselves naturally, but uh, well, if there are so many different uh, points of view, uh, coordinates we can, uh, we can represent the state space in, is there any one that makes most sense than the others to use, right? And uh, we borrowed some tricks from the math and we noticed, hey, look, if you choose as your uh, similarity transformation matrix, a matrix that is composed by the eigenvectors of the uh, A matrix, then you can actually diagonalize the A matrix, right? And this is the result that is in, the, in, the, in this second paragraph here. And um, 
And well, why is this relevant? Well, this is relevant because if we manage to diagonalize the A matrix, then what happens is that when we have x dot in the new coordinates equals a tilde x plus whatever, the a tilde now is a diagonal matrix. Not only it's diagonal, it's diagonal, and the elements of the diagonal are the eigenvectors, sorry, the eigenvalues of the A matrix. And this is powerful, why? For three reasons. First, fundamentally for one reason, one is all different things, but um, the idea is that these coordinates are special. They are, we call them modal coordinates, and they are, let's say, the natural coordinates of the system. They depend on the A matrix, right? A, the A matrix, imagine it always as something that has to do with the physics, has to do, it's like the, the system itself, it's like the, the structure of the system, it depends on the laws of physics and how, it doesn't really depend on how you choose the inputs and how you choose the outputs, that's what I'm trying to say. So, well, we can choose this set of coordinates and the new coordinates are diagonalized. What does it mean? So it means that the evolution of every state variable depends exclusively on, it's a state variable and doesn't have couplings with other state variables. And uh, we can see, and, and most importantly, we can see that any possible evolution of the system can then be represented as a sum of weighted terms of these independent uh, favorite components, which we call modes of a system. And this is what the first equation says. It says, look, x of t can always re be represented as the sum over the order of the system, which is n, how many state variables you have, of uh, vi is the eigenvector. So the eigenvector is something that represents the shape of the response. We're going to see some videos today that where we can actually give a kind of see these things happening. And uh, so vi gives you a shape of the response, a fundamental shape. Imagine every system has some favorite shapes on which it responds. Of course, we don't have to imagine shape as a, as a, as a spatial shape, but as a combination of state variables, right? So it could be uh, linear combinations of uh, speeds, accelerations, uh, uh, positions, whatever, whatever the physical meaning of the state variables is. Each of these way, each of these modes, each of these shapes is weighted by some initial conditions, x tilde, and most importantly, the time evolution is dictated exclusively by the associated eigenvalue, which is lambda i. So this is the first important thing of modal coordinates. The next important thing is that the system is diagonalized, the second equation, which means that every individual xi, x1, x2, x3, in the new coordinates depends only on the dynamics of it, the other, of, of, of xi itself. It doesn't have a coupling with the other ones. Um, and finally, modal coordinates tell us that, forget about the uh, transformation, just take the original system. If you set as initial condition, one of those shapes itself, suppose you know them, then the system will only respond with that shape and uh, a, a time, uh, let's say, um, dependency that is described exclusively by the eigenvalue associated with that, with that shape. So let's look what we mean, just a second. Um, now, of course, uh, this, the videos we're gonna see are, have to, I mean, are, 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 are related to a, to a string. No, so it's a kind of a different system. You have to, it's more complicated if we describe it with, uh, with equations. We have partial differential equations. We have a space component, a time component. I don't know if you're familiar with the structural analysis. But the idea here is that uh, by leveraging this, uh, um, by leveraging this um, notion of, uh, uh, of a modal response, one can come up with, a, with, with, with an input, a special input, that only stimulates some of these modes. So what we're seeing in this video is, okay, if we start giving the right input, can we just make the system respond exactly with these favorite fundamental shapes? And uh, what you see here, these uh, standing waves, these, these, these modes, uh, these uh, shapes at which the, 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 this uh, string responds in terms of, of motion. Um, see, this is the, the second mode. This shape, you have to imagine it with respect to what we are doing as a combination of state variables, okay? And uh, what is the, the nice thing? The nice thing is that, see, now we're choosing some specific inputs to stimulate and see the actual modes. But uh, if you just start hitting that, that, that string in any random way, its response will always be describable 
as a weighted sum of these fundamental shapes, right? So once we figure out these fundamental shapes, well, we know a lot about, about the system. And uh, so this, I, I encourage you to watch the video um, more in detail later, but I think what something interesting here is the following. Uh, so we saw that, uh, that um, these, there are these fundamental shapes that then every, every, every response of the system is a combination, a linear combination of these modes. Now what we're doing here is, is analyzing the other component of the response. We saw there is a term that depends on the x tilde zero vi, which is the shape. And the other one instead is the time dependency. Now we said it's a function of the eigenvalue associated with an eigenvector. What does it mean? It means that basically in this case, each point, like spatial point, goes up and down as a, as a sine wave with a frequency that is exactly that of the eigenvalue. So what they're doing here is basically they're getting a light, they're shining it at that specific frequency. So basically, what do you expect to see? Well, if you know for sure that something is going up and down with some specific frequency, and you just look at it, shining a light on it at a specific frequency means you only see when the light shines on it, and you choose the same frequency, well, you will see the thing static, right? Because every time you look at it, it just went up back to the place where it was before. So there's going to be uh, uh, an apparent uh, uh, static behavior just because we are really experimentally seeing that it's true that the modes respond with that specific uh, frequency time, time dependency. So here, if they're choosing the wrong frequency, so you see the thing moving, now they're tuning the stroboscopic light, boom, now they're looking at it exactly at the frequency of resonance of this thing, and you will see the mode clearly expressed. So now we convinced ourselves that uh, uh, these uh, modal coordinates are useful. And uh, what are we gonna do about it? Well, we're gonna break down the system and we're gonna study how it works because now we can really break down the response of linear time invariant systems in some fundamental components. And this gives us some insight because, for example, we can express the system like this. We did this last time. And what uh, we can say is that, look, uh, so the state variables, x, depend on the, the, some, these bi tildes and the output is a combination of the states. So now we are taking a step forward and we say, okay, we got it how you work linear time invariant system. I broke you down in your fundamental components. But now we want to control these systems. So how are we gonna deal with them? We need to define two concepts, uh, that of observability and controllability. So the concept of controllability is basically something that tells us what is our ability to influence each of the state variable. A system is said to be controllable if it's possible through the input to affect every state variable, to drive the system from any initial condition to zero, for example. Observability instead is the other point of view. It's not the relationship between input and state. Instead, it's the relationship between state and, as out, and output. Observability asks the question, is it, is it possible to reconstruct any of state's initial conditions of a, of a system, for example, based exclusively on the knowledge of the output and the input to the system? So basically, by looking at something, can we tell what is the evolution of the state variables? It's, it's not, it's not uh, obvious. It, it's, it's not something we should assume for granted for every possible system. So, well, if we look at the system in the modal coordinates that we showed before, modal coordinates diagonalize things, so it's very easy to look at each component, it just depends on itself. So we can tell that a system is controllable if each one, if basically the BIs, that is determine the equation that describes the effect of the input on each state variable are different from zero. And observability instead, we saw that the equation of the output, y, was a linear combination of c1 tilde, x1 tilde, plus c2 tilde, and so on. So as long as those ci's are different from zero, it means that each state variable appears in the output, and therefore it means that we can um, reconstruct it. So these are a few examples. And um, let's try this thing. Uh, well, I guess I'll just use the black part. So what is the, I just want to make an example here to see, to show you that, uh, what, what, what do things mean, right? So I guess we need to close this. And um, so, 
what's the objective here? It's telling if a system is uh, uh, observable and, control or, and or controllable. So let's take a system. A system could be, for example, a mass spring damper system, where we have our first mass here that is moving around. We have a second mass here. Can you see up there? Yes? All good? You're not tripping this. Uh, so we have a second mass here. It's moving around, and uh, we choose, uh, for example, the first coordinate x1 to be the position of this first mass. We can choose x2 to be the position of this other mass. Uh, what do we need to say? We need to say maybe that this variable, this, this, these are springs, right? So springs have the elastic constants. This is k1, this is k2. What else is relevant? Well, maybe what is relevant is uh, saying that suppose that we can stimulate the system from uh, here. So we define the input as a force applied to the center of this mass. And what else do we need to describe a system? We have the input. We have, uh, I guess the states are going to be a combination of what goes on in the system, right? Position, speeds, accelerations. And this is because of F equal MA, is because of physics. And uh, what do we need? We need an output, right? The output is pretty much what we choose. So I don't know. Let's suppose the output is, uh, is, is this position here, or it could be any other thing. So how do we go about modeling this, right? How do we go from, uh, from uh, laws of physics to an ABCD representation, right? Because we want to find eventually x dot equals ax plus bu and y equals cx plus du. Well, so I'm sure you guys know, remember even better than me how to do these things. But we will start by do the, doing the free body diagrams. I am going to throw this away. So off, should be off. So what are we going to do about this? Well, it's a simple problem. We're just operating in one direction. So what we really want to do is the use F equals MA. So we're going to say the sum of the external forces applied on this thing is equal to M, uh, what is it, M1, X, uh, what did we call it, one double dot. Double dot, of course, is the double derivative in time. So what's going on here? Well, we defined this system to have a positive motion in this sense, so it means we're going to have mx1 double dot here. Uh, so let's look at what's going on. If we move this a little bit to the right, then the spring is going to elongate. It's going to push us back in this direction. So there's definitely going to be a k1 x1 here, and then the spring is going to, uh, the stiff moves to the right, it's going to compress this spring, that's going to give us a force back in this direction. How much is that force? Well, it's uh, definitely proportional to k2, and it's definitely bigger the more we press it, so it's going to be uh, proportional to x1, and definitely it's uh, smaller the more um, this moves again, this moves to the right because it's elongating, so it's going to be something like this. Um, am I forgetting anything? Uh, there is a spring, there is another spring, there is inertia. What is there more? I guess the input, right? We've got a U like this here. So now how do we find the equations of the system? We just do the balance, right? So we've got mx double dot plus k1x1 plus k2x1 minus x2 is equal to U. Does any of you disagree with this? Yes, no, maybe. Agree, disagree? Raise your hand if you agree. Raise your hand, the other hand if you strongly disagree. Good enough. Yes? A negative distance for the second spring. So the idea is like you can really, as long as you define this positive or negative, you can play around with that sign as you wish, right? It doesn't really matter. So the, let's use physical intuition. It's a spring. So a spring always wants to be in equilibrium. It's going to push back if you deform it, right? So if x1 is moving like this, the spring is going to be compressed. If it compresses, it's going to push back. So the force is coming in this direction because we defined x1 positive in the other one. It's going to be definitely proportional to x1. And of course, x2, it's positive in the other direction. So if you increase x2, the spring is actually decompressing. So the force is going to be smaller. So it makes sense to do x1 minus x2. OK, so this is good. Um, we have to do the same thing for the other mass. So we've got m2. At this point, uh, u will be pretty much 
convinced that this is x2 if I say that we've got m2 x2 double dot here and we have what? If we move in this direction, then the spring is going to pull us back. It's going to be uh, k2 times what here? Well, the more we move away, the more the spring is going to push us back. So my guess is x2 minus x1 here, and I'm kind of jumping. So is there anything else that I forgot here? No, because there is no input. So what are the dynamical equations that govern the equilibrium of this mass, second mass? Well, it's going to be m2x2 double dot plus k2x2 minus x1 equal to zero. Well, good. So now how do we get to ABCD? Well, uh, we need to do some uh, magic. So what magic are we going to do? Well, first we're going to we're going to say, look, um, let's say x1 is x1, right? We defined it already. x2 is x2, we defined it already. So let's not mess around with the definitions we already have. Um, but we can say that x3 is x1 dot, okay? And x4 is x2 dot. Now, uh, mx1 here, all this stuff, let's rewrite it. How does this look like? This looks like, so bear with me. It's not about physics, right? So let's make m1, m2, k1, and k2 all ones. Doesn't really matter. We're just looking at how to, to, to um, get A, B, C, D matrices here. So, so what? X1 dot, we defined X3 to be X1 dot. So what is X1 double dot? X1 double dot is X3 dot, right? Because if you take the derivative of X3, you get X1 double dot. So here we got one times X3 dot plus X1 plus X1 minus X2 is equal to you. What about the other equation? Well, same deal here. We've got X4 dot, X4 dot plus what? Plus uh, X2 minus X1 equal to zero. Is this right? Have I done any mistakes? Good? We're good. So, okay, now what are we looking for? We're looking for AX dot equals AX plus BU. So let's really spell this out. You see what I'm doing here, right? So this is going to be A, this is X, this is B, and this is U. So this, of course, it's going to be X dot. So here we're going to put X1 dot, X2 dot, X3 dot, and X4 dot. Here we have X1, X2, X3, and X4. Remember, we have only one input, right? We're studying CISO systems. So, so what are we going to do now? Well, we have to translate these equations into this form. How, well, so X1 dot is a function of what? Well, X1 dot is equal to X3. We defined it this way. So X1 dot is equal to X3. What does it mean? It means zero, zero, one, zero, correct? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, thank you. So what about X2 dot? Well, uh, X2 dot, here it is, it's equal to X4. Zero, 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 one. What about X3 dot? X3 dot is here. So, of course, we have to put it on the other side of the equation. These are two X1s that become minus two X1 plus X2. So it's going to be minus two X1. There's going to be one X2. Are there any X3s and X4s? I don't see any zero, zero. What about this other guy? Well, this other guy, xx4 dot, is equal to what? Is equal to plus x1 minus x2, zero, zero. Now, what about the B matrix? Well, the B matrix uh, is what relates U to the states. U appears only here. So U goes and affect what? It affects the evolution of x3 dot. So U, the B matrix is going to be zero because U, U has no effect on x1. 
0, 1, 0. Does that make this make any sense? Yes, thank you. So we've got a b now. What about uh, what about y c and d? Well, I'll write it up here. Y is going to be something times x1, x2, x3, and x4 plus something times u. u is a one by one. Y is a one by one because it's a CISO system. This means that d is a one by one. It's only a scalar. And this has to be what? Since the state is an n by one, this must be an n one by n. This is, of course, c. OK, so this is C. This is D. Beautiful. So where is Y? Well, Y, we arbitrarily defined it to be, for example, the output, the position X2. So Y is X2. So this is 0, 1, 0, 0. And D is what? Well, I don't see any effect, direct effect of the input on the output, which is the case kind of with most systems. So D is equal to 0. OK, so now we have A, B. So we, we got a system. We got the A, B, C, D state space representation. What are we going to do about it? Well, um, I will not uh, do this by hand. Otherwise, we're going to stay here until tomorrow. But it's, uh, if you now go and calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the A matrix, and you, you define the T uh, transformation matrix for the modal coordinates to be just take the eigenvectors and put them in column one next to each other, and you crank through the passages of similarities we've seen before, you get the A tilde, B tilde, C tilde, and D tilde matrices like this. What, are, what, what information do these tell us? Well, we define controllability of observability. We know they depend on the components on the B and C. Look at the components of the B tilde matrix. Wherever you look at, there's something. They're all different from zero. Some are real, some are imaginary, but they're different from zero, right? So what does it mean? It means that if we send the input to the system in this way, we can affect all the state variables. Let's think about it physically for a second. If you have these two masses in a row, you shake one in the middle, is it true that if you shake it uh, with a crafty enough shaking, you can uh, affect the position of, the, of both of the masses? Yes. Can you affect the speeds of both of the masses? Yes. So it makes sense. It's intuitive. The system is controllable. You can affect all the modal important coordinates through the input. Is it observable? What does it mean observable intuitively? If we just look at the position of the, of the, of the second mass, x3, and we know what the input is, and of course we know a, b, c, and d, can we tell how each and every one of the state variables is evolving? Well, here we have to look at the components of the C tilde matrix. They're all different. This is kind of less intuitive, but in this way, thanks to modal coordinates, we can break down the individual contributions to the output, and we can tell that, look, each one of the states, because each C i is different from zero, C tilde i is different from zero, each one of the states is contributing to the output. Therefore, we will be able to reconstruct it, and we'll show in a few slides how. This system is both controllable and unobservable, okay? I do not have the time to do this now, but the idea is that uh, now get another mass that, that, that is up there. Do the exact same thing we did now at the blackboard. We'll find out that this system is not observable and actually not even controllable, partially. Some modes are controllable, some are not. Some are observable, some are not. Of course, it's not a black and white situation. It's not like uh, either the system is controllable or, the system, or not, unobservable or not. There might be some of these fundamental shapes, modes, which are uh, observable and controllable, and some others not. So that's very nice and intuitive, right? But there is a problem. The problem is that uh, it's kind of a pain to put every system every time in model coordinates when you want to go and look if it's controllable and observable. So, so if one uh, thinks about it a little bit more, and uh, we can do this. Uh, in uh, at the blackboard again. If, uh, um, if we think about observability for a second, so as we move on, we will see that observability and controllability are intimately related to each other. There are two problems that is, they're set to be the dual of each other. So it's very, 
you can take conclusions on one by looking at the other, very similar in structure. But for now, um, let's just look at the observability problem. What is the observability, what, what, what is the fundamental question of the observability problem? It's, it's, it's asking us, suppose we know y, okay, of t, of course. And suppose we know u of t. From these two guys, can we get x of t in any situation? It's the fundamental thing. Suppose we know u of t, okay? So if we know u of t, well, let's just put it to zero so that it doesn't mess our calculations. Because if we know it, whatever contribution of u there is gonna be in this problem, we can just remove it, right? Because we know u. So let's study the problem of, suppose u is equal to zero, we've got a y of t, can we reconstruct x of t? Well, 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 but uh, we know that y of t is equal to what? From the system, it's equal to cx of t, right? Plus another part that is equal to zero. So, but this is a one by one. This is what? This is an n by one. This is a one by n. The question is, can I get x if I know y? Can you get x if you know y? Can you invert the C matrix? Can you just get this out of the way? Can you do... C inverse of C inverse, this goes away and you're done? No, because this is a vector. How do you do the inverse of a vector? It doesn't really make sense, right? So, no, this is something you cannot do. Don't do it at home. So what you can do instead is, uh, is, 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 is thinking on this, uh, in this direction, right? What are we going to think about? We want to make, we want to eventually get to a point. We start from Y of T equals a C X of T. We know that this is an m by one. We know this has to be a one by m because we chose a single input, single output system. So the output is a one by one. What we want to do is get this to be something that we can invert. So, well, well, uh, it's a one by n. We want to make it a matrix. We know how to do inverses of matrices. So I guess we have to do something about it such that we get to an m by n matrix. But remember, we only know the output, right? We don't know anything else. We can't leverage any other information. But if we know the output, then what about we do y of t is equal cx of t? What about y dot of t? I and mean, we know the output, we can take derivatives. So y dot is equal to cx dot, but we know that x dot, this is the, our favorite equation, is equal ax plus bu, but u is equal to zero, right? So it's c a x of t. What about we take y double dot? It's the a square x of t. Now, how long do I need to continue? Does this make any sense? Simple derivatives, right? So how long do we need to continue? Well, we want to get to the point where this thing here is an m by n. We want to stack all of these together. y dot, y double dot. Actually, instead of using dots that you can't see from the end of the class, let's express derivatives with a parenthesis like this. Okay, so this would be the nth derivative of y. So this is the zeroth derivative of y. This is the, one, the first derivative of y. Down, 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 up to, what is it? Does it make sense? Bigger, bigger, sorry. Oh, my bad. So we get the zeroth derivative of y. The first derivative of y, up to where? where when, when shall we stop? We'll stop at whatever derivative, such that we can potentially get a square matrix there so we can invert it. Well, we know this is a one by n, we want to get an m by n. We will trust me if this has to be chosen as m by one. I mean, there's not really to trust, just count the rows and, 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 and their n, right? So if we do this game, where now we express all these derivatives, and here we just get x of t. We've got c, c a, down, 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 up to c a, n minus one. Now this is an n by n matrix, right? We, by construction. So if we can invert this matrix, let's call this matrix, I don't know, let's call it uh, O as observability matrix. So what happens? We've got this, and let's call this big Y, just because I don't want to rewrite it, the whole thing. So Y big is T is equal to this observability matrix times X of T. 
Well, if there exists an inverse of this observability matrix, we can get x of t is equal to the inverse times y. We know the output, and all it's all derivatives. We suppose that we know everything there is to know about the output. Well, in this case, we can reconstruct the state from the output. The, the system is observable. Um, it turns out that this condition holds exactly even in discrete time. You can try that at home. Just be careful that there's no such thing as a derivative in discrete time, right? So you have to understand what is the nuisance. So that thing there is called the observability matrix. It's really important. And if that observability matrix has full rank, that is, uh, it can be inverted, then the system is observable. And but you, somebody could argue, but sorry, you stopped at the n minus one's derivative. Why? Just because you wanted to make it square. But you, I mean, in this kind of mathematical ideal scenario, we could take infinite derivatives of y. No, well, why stop at n minus one? Well, why don't we just put in other rows? And the reason is called Cam, uh, Kylie Hamilton. It's a theorem that says that any nth power of a matrix is always a linear combination, can be always expressed as a linear combination of the other n minus one things. So if we were to add any other row to that matrix, see a at the n, n plus one, so on, it, we can prove it that for every system, they're going to be linearly dependent from the other. So they're not going to increase the rank of the observability matrix. See you in 10 minutes. OK, so we just saw that it's possible to uh, tell if a system is controllable or observable by looking at this, uh, sorry, observable. Hello? Break is over. So we saw that we can tell if a system is observable by looking at the observability matrix that is defined as above. And um, for some reason that we're not going to get into right now, uh, it turns out that the same, a similar condition applies for controllability. You can tell that a system is controllable if the matrix B, B, A, and so on, the controllability matrix has an inverse, okay? So, all good. Why is this useful? Well, we just saw that the evolution of a system, the stability of a system, can be described by looking at the eigenvalues of the A matrix, right? So just to give you a teaser on the, on the power of control, we will ask ourselves a question, but so what about, is it possible to figure out an input such that we can actually change the eigenvalues of the A matrix? It's the most obvious thing, right? We want to control a system. We just saw that the output of a system depends on the eigenvalues of the A matrix. We should at least ask ourselves the question, can you change the eigenvalues of an A matrix through some feedback? So, so I think it's, 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 it's nice to see this once. Um, what about I use that blackboard there? Okay, so what are we going to do here? Um, can you all see this, even from there? Yes? So what's the point? Um, we are going to look at a very simple case. We're going to make a point here. We're going to say, look, there is a specific situation in which we can arbitrarily place the eigenvalues of the A matrix. It's huge. Arbitrarily placed means I don't care system who you are, nature, I don't mind. I, I can just change exactly your behavior to what I want it to be. If that was possible all the time, well, we could obtain arbitrary performance, arbitrary behavior from any dynamical system that can be expressed like a linear time invariant system and would be great. And in fact, that's kind of what we try to build upon going forward. So let's suppose that we have a simple system, x dot equals ax plus bu. And uh, let's suppose it's a scalar system, okay? So A, it's a small A, so it's very simple. The eigenvalues of a scalar, it's the scalar itself. So A is the eigenvalue. Well, if we look at this, we know that X of T has an evolution that depends on A, right? So suppose we are in a condition in which A is a positive number. It's a very bad situation. This means that this is time, this is X of T, well, uh, if uh, suppose we start from an initial condition here, 
uh, if A is positive, it means that this thing grows exponentially, right? It's very not stable. Right? So the question is, this is clearly an undesirable situation, right? So we ask ourselves, can we um, stabilize this system? So basically what this means is, can we change the A? Can we make the A become a more desirable A hat or A star or A whatever you want? That is something we choose, okay? So to, to, to get there, we need to think about something. So, and here we will introduce a, a, an important terminology that I bet is gonna be very confusing to you going forward, so it's, it's, it's nice to clarify it now. So you have seen this diagram many times, right? You've got an input, you've got an output, in the middle we have a system, let's call it sigma only for today. From the end of the class today onwards, we'll never call it sigma again. But what is this? This is what we define as an open loop situation. Why is it open loop? Because you change the input, the input goes through the system, and the output comes out. You've got x dot is equal to ax plus bu, and y is equal to what? Is equal to cx plus du. It's open loop. You send your u's in, you get your y's. Straightforward. Now, what if we, we looked at this before, we said, what if we chose a U in some way that was affected by the output itself? We take the output and we feed it back to the system. Let's say we put a minus here, okay? Now, this belongs to here. Now here, what are we doing? We're saying that x dot is always equal to ax plus bu, right? And y is always equal to whatever, cx plus du. But what is u? u, in this case, is equal to minus y, okay? y is the signal, goes here, this is zero, so u is equal to minus y. This is what we call closed loop. Going forward, you'll hear many times say uh, the open loop transfer function. Spoiler, you don't know what a transfer function is yet, but or a closed loop transfer function. And it's completely different things, okay? So open loop is what the system is on its own, how it comes from the shop, okay? Closed loop is when you try to control it. Closed loop is, let's say, the engineered system. Open loop is the natural system. So where am I heading here? I just want to say that if we are smart about our choice of of the close of the input when we close the loop, we can do the magic. Suppose u is equal to minus kx, okay? So we're supposing here that the output is equal to the state. Big assumption. But suppose that I could write something like this, u equals minus kx. So this is the open loop. What would be the closed loop dynamics? The closed loop dynamics would be x dot is equal to ax plus b minus ku minus b kx, correct? Which is a way of saying a minus b kx. Note, a is the ugly number of the system that comes from the, 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 the structure physical laws. b is B, it's always a system, depends where you put your inputs. K is what? K is whatever we want, it's the gain, okay? We get to choose the K. So what did we say? We wanted this to be some A tilde. Well, just choose K such that this is A tilde. What is K? K is equal to what? It's equal to A minus A tilde over B, right? If you choose K like this, then you get a closed loop system that is uh, x dot equals a tilde x. Suppose x, we choose a tilde in a reasonable way. For example, something that gives us stability. For example, a negative number. Say it again. 
Of course you can. But, but you have to use the microphone. Or I have to reply, repeat your question. Go ahead. No, it's just a different. Uh, so the question was, does A tilde have anything to do with the modal core? Okay. <laughs> like you to come up here. So the um, situation is that tilde here has nothing to do with the coordinates of before. You can call this A star if you want, if it's confusing. It's just to say something different from A. It's a new way that we get to choose what it is. Does it make sense? No? Is it confusing? I mean, the idea is you get a system that is the, whose behavior is determined by the properties of the system. What does the properties of the system mean? The A matrix. What's the A matrix? The relationship between X dot and A and X. In this simple case of a scalar system, it's just a scalar. It's just a small A, okay? Suppose the small A is positive. Small A is positive. This is A bigger than zero. We get an ugly answer, an ugly response. It's unstable, right? Not good. Things blow up. But an initial condition that is bounded, it's not yet one of stable. It goes, X of T goes to infinity. Well, it's not good. So we want to do something about it. We want to control the system. How? You, this simple system is controllable by just choosing the A, because the A is everything that defines how things are going. So if we had an A that were negative, we would obtain something like this, right? An asymptotically stable system, because E at the minus something goes to zero eventually with time. Okay? Now, the cool thing is that if we choose, let's say, A star, it's like, well, if we choose the, the magnitude of A to be whatever, we can actually regulate that response to be whatever we want. Could be this fast, could be even faster, okay? It's nice, we can actually tune the performance of the system. So what, what is this thing we've just done? We've just shown that in a simple condition, if you can do feedback, if you can close the loop and choose your input in this magic way here as proportional to the state, you can arbitrarily replace the poles of a system to be whatever you want it to be. This technique is called pole placement and it's the killer, it's like the how do you make a wall, brick wall fly for feed forward control? This is the feedback version of it. How do you make anything be whatever you want it to be? Just do state feedback. What's the catch? Otherwise, you will be finished, right? Like, see you next week for the exam, basically. What's the catch? There is an obvious practical problem in this approach. Anybody want to guess? Yes, sir. So what did we say? Exactly that. Y has to be equal to X, right? So we said many times that, uh, I stressed it before, you, you as in the signal you, you get to choose it. It's engineered, it's what we do. Y, it's the system output, it's what you can measure. X, it was, goes on in the middle. X is not accessible in general terms. We don't know X, we can measure Y by definition of the whole thing that we set up. So assuming that we know X, uh, that's how sure we can do feedback, it's a huge assumption. It's absolutely not, uh, not, no, not the case, generally. In fact, this will drive the next like, 100 years of evolution of control systems. How do we figure out the X, right? So, because if we had the X, then we could do whatever we wanted. And in fact, we will see at uh, uh, one of the last classes of this course how to find the X. Uh, intuitively, you will uh, already know that you can find the X when the system is observable, right? But anyways, so this just a, 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 a teaser of, uh, of uh, where are we heading towards. If we know the state of the system, we do feedback, we're game. We can basically achieve arbitrarily good performance through pole placement. So, Generally speaking, in the very simpler case, the bigger K is in magnitude, so the more the negative feedback is strong, the more the A star would be a negative number, like minus 100, minus 1,000, minus a million. And in theory, if you look at the response, the smaller A is, the faster it converges to zero, the, the most steeper this response is. So in the most vanilla of cases, you can say, hey, do negative feedback, plug a K, just a proportional gain that is big as possible, our system is gonna be stabilized and it's gonna have wonderful performance. Is this always the case? No, 
Otherwise, it would be too easy. So don't worry about what you're not seeing. Ah, I've been like doing slides and you're not even seeing what I'm doing. Okay, so <laughs> this is an example we did at the board uh, with some real numbers. What all this is saying is that, okay, doing closed loop feedback has a stabilizing effect. In simple cases, the more you make k big, the better things become, but it's not generally the case. And this, so don't worry about what you're seeing here. This, we will dedicate a full class to understand how to draw these diagrams. But what you're looking at is given a specific system, suppose we're doing that game that we just did there. So we do state feedback, proportional state feedback. We just do u equals minus kx, and we play around with k. We just say, yeah, k is smaller or bigger. As k becomes big, the blue crosses there is where the poles of the closed loop system Remember here it's critical, don't confuse it with the open loop. The more I move k, look at how the poles of the closed loop system, which are the A stars, behave. The simple system, we start from the right. The more k is big, the more the poles go in this direction, which means they become more negative, okay? The real part becomes bigger. The system E at the AT, if A is a very negative number, goes to zero much faster, it's good. So these, these graphs, they're called the um, root locus, and as the word suggests, it's the locus that is the place, the, 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 the evolution of uh, the roots of the uh, closed loop transfer function. But we, we, we'll see by the end of the class, this will be clear. Forget about what they mean, this, how do you get these? This is a system where you've got a second order system, right? Second order system, what does it mean? It means that it has two x's, so a is a two by two, it's on a scalar, what does it mean? It means that it has at least two eigenvalues. So to, if in this case we are to just increase k mindlessly, you will just immediately see that it's not always good. Because you start from that circle, as you move, the two different eigenvalues will eventually loop back to the positive side. So this from zero onwards, this is the is the real part of the eigenvalues, right? That's the imaginary part. So we know stability really only depends on the real part. If the real part of the uh, eigenvalues of the A matrix in closed loop is positive, it's bad news because E at the positive goes unstable. If it's negative, we are in the left-hand plane, it's beautiful. Things go to, uh, are asymptotically stable. So what we care is to make sure that all the possible, for, imagine this graph at every K, you choose, you are in one specific spot. So all the k's that make us both have both of the eigenvalues on the left-hand plane are good. But this is just to show the takeaway from this graph is simply you can't just always increase k. Like if you, there are situations in where if you just increase k arbitrarily, at some point you'll get positive eigenvalues as well, the system will go unstable. And the more you complicate things, the more these, these, these graphs become complicated. So the takeaway from these examples is just feedback through state with the K is good news, typically works. It's not as easy as just put a very big K. Okay, um, now we're gonna move on to something which is actually the topic of the day. <laughs> Half an hour before. Um, we're gonna move on to something that is, uh, uh, is critically important. Like if you want to remember one thing from today's class and is, is what we're going to do now. So up to now, what did we do? Uh, we said uh, we've got a real system. Uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. We get to a mathematical representation. Most systems in the world are described by nonlinear systems, a set of equations, but we know how to linearize them. So we get an LTI system. Through an LTI system, we study all the time as response to evolution. We figured out these modal coordinates and all these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And that led us to some intuition of how to actually go and control a system. Which is what we just did, no? Uh, it's not straightforward. At least it's, how many of you think it's a straightforward? Like, of course, you could do this while you're sleeping. We have uh, another way of doing this, which is beautiful. And uh, it's called the transfer function. And today we're gonna look a little bit of what these transfer functions are. From today onwards, you'll fundamentally always only think about transfer functions because they are the secret and the trick to control systems. So what is a transfer function? So remember uh, the output of a system, right? So um, this tells you all there is to know about the output of the system. Now, 
we derived this output by leveraging the principle of superposition, and we said, look, there's a term that will depend only on the initial condition, another term that depends only on the input. We studied up to now all there was to know about the first of these two terms, right? The one that depended on the initial conditions, which is the one that depends on E at the AT, which is one that depends on the eigenvalues of the A matrix and all of that. We kind of always ignored that the second term. Did you notice? That, ah, the force response, whatever. Bebo stable, okay, whatever that means. Uh, but really, uh, we did this because it was convenient to study the first part, which was easier because it's more tied to the structural properties of the system in this beautiful way of the eigenvalues of the A matrix. And now we need to figure out, though, how does the system respond, like really, to a given input, right? So there is that messy second term there. Some of you might recognize as a convolution integral, but just a messy integral. That, uh, that determines exactly what is the relationship between the input and the output of the system. Kind of important, right? So the question now becomes, how do we figure out some properties of this second term? And, uh, and so the strategy we're going to use is that to try to see how this works for some uh, simple inputs. We'll leverage what are, why are sim simple because the math turns out to be nice and treatable and because they're meaningful. And then we'll leverage superposition. Say, hey, if I understand the output of the system to us, it's the same principle we used to get this form, but we're going to use it in a different way. We're going to say, if I understand now what the output, the second term in particular of the output is with respect to a specifically beautiful crafted input, then if I sum a bunch of those inputs, the output is going to be just the sum of the outputs corresponding to the independent inputs, principle of linearity as before. And then there's going to be a last step. That's going to be the magic, which you say, hey, what if, how beautiful would a world be if we had a way to represent any possible signal in the world as a sum of the very simple ones we're going to study? If that holds, then me, this, this approach of studying the output of the system as sums of very simple ones will just generalize to any input in the world. And we will see that this is actually the case, like there's black magic going on today. Okay. So how do we get to this? So the secret is simple, is uh, assume the simple, easy input that we're going to study is E at the ST. Up there, U of T is equal E at the ST, where S is a complex number. Okay? Say, why, why is this relevant? It's relevant because, um, because, Let's go there. Some of you might remember, or not maybe, that there is a nice, um, if we do E at the, what? E at the, um, J omega T, where J, where J is an imaginary number. This, is always equal to the cosine of omega t plus j of the sine of omega t. And if I were to put a minus here, I would get a minus there. This is called Euler's formula. Have you ever seen it before? Yes. Of course, right? As you know, some people say this is the most beautiful formula ever existed. It's like really. Oh, we'll get into that later. And no, we won't, but we could get into that later. But it's really, really powerful and nice formula. By using that formula, um, we can, for example, just by combining two inputs that are complex conjugate of each other, so E at the ST plus E at the minus ST, we could get a real signal. We could get a cosine or a sine. Just try to sum two of those E at the J omega T, playing around with the signs, you get combinations of cosines and sines. So... And this is what these two examples are saying. So from now on, we're going to say, okay, now let's study the output. If we got E at the ST as an input, if D is a complex number, we're always going to assume that we're going to send uh, both the complex signal and its complex conjugate, one. And so you can imagine U of T to be, in general, like a half of a sinusoid, so to speak. So we're studying the response of the system to these half sinusoids. 
Um, let's do this calculation because it's fun and it's important. Maybe not really fun. So, I need to wash here. So are there any questions about this? So do, do you understand what we're trying to do now? More or less. So the idea is we understood how to do what, what the free response of the system looks like and, how, and what it depends on. It depends on the eigenvalues of the A matrix. Now we're going to try and see, but how do we figure out the other term of the output, the one that is a function of u, OK? And to understand that, we have to, we're going to use a strategy. The strategy is uh, study, leverage uh, superposition because we're doing linear systems. In fact, everything we're doing now works for linear systems, but does not work for nonlinear systems. So uh, we don't care. We're doing linear systems. And uh, what's the deal? So the deal is the following. See, check out these passages slow, carefully, so that uh, you are convinced about what is going on. So we've got y of t is equal to what? y of t is equal to cx plus bu. C is um, uh, e at the a t x naught plus c integral from 0 to t, e at the a t minus tau, b u of tau in d tau, plus d u of t. Correct? Yeah. What's this uh, shit chatter in the background? Any doubt? Did I do a mistake? Do you have any questions? No questions? OK, so what's the deal now? We're going to suppose that u is equal to e at the st. And we want to check what is y when we use this input. And you would say, why in the world do we want to do this? We want to do this because it will turn out that this is an easy, meaningful input that represents a component of any possible input in the world. If we get almost any possible input in the world. If we just want to know what is the relationship between any possible u of t and y of t, we will understand it by understanding its component of the response, which are these signals here. So this extra passage will be clear at the end of the class, but let's first study how the system responds to e at the st. How do we do it? Well, just plug in e at the st and see what happens. So let's do it. Let's do it. Y of t is equal to what? It's equal to e, c e at the a t x naught plus the c integral from 0 to t of what? Of uh, e at the a t, I'll write it like this, minus a tau b e at the s tau in d tau plus d u of t, which is e at the st. Does it make sense? If you don't complain, I'll assume you agree. Careful. Uh, this is... OK, so what about this mess? This mess, we can do something about it. Because we can say, we can say that, so this is an integral in tau, right? So e at the at is not a function of tau, it's a function of t. We can bring this out. c at the at, integral from 0 to t of what? Of, uh, let's put these two terms together. So d, this is a scalar, right? Because s is a complex number. So this is a one by one. We can move this around through matrices. It doesn't really matter. So we get... Uh, e at the s tau minus a tau, we just gather the tau and we can write this as i minus a tau times b times, that's it, in the tau plus d e at the s t. Now, 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 important, suppose exists S I minus A inverse. 
What does this mean? S is not an eigenvalue of A. Here is the... Does this make sense to you? It's just a way of saying, look, if this part, this thing, the inverse of S i minus A exists, then we can do something that we're about to do. And this exists when S doesn't make this guy go to zero. This is the inverse, right? The inverse of a thing with a matrix. How do you do the inverse of a matrix? You do whatever, whatever divided by the, the characteristic polynomial, the determinant of S i minus A, right? So basically, the determinant of SI minus A is going to be zero only if S is an eigenvalue of A, because by definition, that makes the characteristic polynomial equal to zero. That's how you find the eigenvalues of a matrix. So let's suppose this is true. Then we can do the integral here. Why did I do this? Because I want to solve this integral here. So Y of T will be what? Will be... C E at the A T X naught plus C E at the A T times what? Times the something. The something is the integral of that, which is S I minus A inverse E at E at the S I minus A evaluated between t and zero. Uh, this is a tau here, important. Uh, there is a b, right, from the integral, plus d e, e at the st. Does anybody of you disagree with this? Shima, did I make the calculations right? All good? good. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, this is a simply plugging in the two extremes. So we get this, x naught plus c e at the a t. What do we get here? We get s i minus a inverse e at the s i minus a t minus one i. B plus D E at the S T. Okay, now we need to play around with these uh, uh, things a little bit. So check this out. Let's focus only on this term here. S I minus A inverse is this times this, actually with a minus in front, and we've got this times this. S I minus A inverse. Here we've got uh, E at the ST times E at the minus AT, right? Okay, B plus D E at the ST. Here we've got C E at the AT. Here we've got the usual stuff. Why is this cool? This is cool because now we get C E at the AT. Let's see if we're ready to do this passage. Uh, are you following, more or less? We're just doing straightforward math, right? So um, what's going on here? The interesting part is that C at the AT goes, has a term X naught, this one. Then there's a term here, C at the AT minus this. So we gather C at the AT, we can write the minus part. Right? Now there's another term. Is it another term? Not really, because we have C at the AT times the C at the minus AT. So this parts go away, and we have plus. So not C, so E at the AT and E at the minus AT go away. We have C S I minus A inverse B. And I think I did a mistake here. We have a B that is missing. We can gather this with the D that comes out from here times E at the ST. Is this right, wrong? Did I do some mistake? Good. 
Okay, beautiful. Look at this. We've got the secret of the universe in our hands. Why? Because we can now see that when you stimulate a system, linear time invariant system, linear time invariant system, with this magical input u equals e at the st, we get an output that is divided in two parts. A first part that depends on e at the at. As time passes by, the dynamics of this is regulated by this e at the at term. We call this a transient response. Then we have this other part here. This other part here, instead, depends on the input. We call this, suppose we've got a stable system. What does, what does it mean to have a stable system? We just set it up to now. A stable system is when you've got the eigenvalues of the A matrix that are, have, let's suppose it's a continuous time system, so negative real part. If it's a continuous, it means that if it's a stable, it means that this part here will go to zero. So after some time, this part won't exist anymore. It will go to zero if there is a stable system, if the system is stable. So this part here will stay instead. We'll call it a steady state response. OK, so let's continue from the slides and see if I messed up something. Looks pretty much the same thing, right? I guess so. So we've got the first term and the second one. Now, what's the beautiful thing is that if the system is stable, the whole first part goes to zero. So the relationship between the input E at the ST and the output Y of T at steady state, which is what we care, like after time has sufficient time has passed that all the transient behaviors have died out, the relationship between these two, these two signals, inputs and outputs, it's governed by one function that is parametric with respect to s. s was some number, a complex number we chose as the exponent of this input signal. We call it g of s. And the g of s, which has a very clear expression, it's a c times s i minus a inverse b plus d, if you have the feed through term, that's called the transfer function. It's the function that regulates the transfer, the passage, the influence of the input over the output signal. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or doubts? We, did the, uh, we didn't cheat, right? We just plugged in U of T equals some magic input, and we got that term. And we said that term, we will define it as a transfer function. Why? Because we believe, we, are, we have the confidence, that that E at the ST signal is actually a meaningful signal. Why is it meaningful? Because it will turn out that any possible signal can be expressed as a sum of these E at the STs. And since we're studying linear systems, well, then superposition um, principle, if we understand the response to one of the components, then we'll know the response of the sum because we just sum them up. And uh, to convince ourselves, uh, we will see this uh, nice thing that, uh, so we said that uh, today it's lots of math, you see? It's nice, I like it. So we said that uh, now the steady state response uh, is going to be equal to some function, which we call g of s times, oops, times uh, the, the, the e at the st. No? Suppose you're sending in a signal, an input that is a cosine. OK, we'll put a 2 here just to make the calculations as simple. What, why is it a cosine? So what is a cosine? How do we express a cosine? Remember that we just figured out that this was the answer if we had the u equal at e at, e at the st, right? So, well, but this can be expressed. Look, look at Euler's formula. It's e at the j omega t plus e at the minus j omega t, right? 
because we get this plus the minus, the j sine of omega t goes away, you get cosine of omega t plus cosine of omega t, which is actually two cosine of omega t. Okay, so basically we can say that the steady state response of a, sig of a system, when you send a cosine of omega t as input, Note as now inside the blocks, I'm never going to put again in my life a sigma because now you know that it's called transfer function, what exactly goes on between the input and the output. So what we will do is we will see that uh, we can use superimposition. So the steady state output is basically just the sum of the output that comes from this input plus the sum of the output that comes from this other input. So we got G evaluated at S. S now is this part here, right? With the minus. So it's G at the J omega, E at the J omega T, plus G of minus J omega, E at the minus J omega T. And, uh, and what from now, from here? Um, and uh, this turns out that it can be expressed uh, This can be expressed as, uh, um, as some number, we'll call it M, times the cosine of omega t plus some other number that we'll call phi. So we'll, we will fill in the passages later, but if you send an input that is a sine wave, where cosine is basically a sine, you get as a, at steady state, you get an output that is some number that changes the magnitude of your sinusoidal input. And it actually turns out that it's the magnitude of G of J omega plus times the same cosine wave at the same exact frequency omega. You see the input was omega T and you get omega T as the answer, but with a some delay, an additional phase, which is, we will see, is exactly the phase of G of J omega, which is the phase of what you would obtain with a transfer function by putting S equal to whatever is the exponent of your input, okay? And uh, remember what we showed the other time in class. We said, uh, if you have and we said G of S is, is, is a complex number, right? So a complex number in general can be written like this. And if this is Gauss plane, so here we put the real part, here we put the imaginary part. Then this is A, this is B. Well, this is the magnitude of G, this is the phase of G. And uh, it turns out that it's easy to see that the magnitude of G of J omega is equal to the just geometric consideration, the real part of G of J omega squared plus the imaginary part squared. I'm gonna, gonna put in the thing because it takes too long. And the phase instead, it's gonna be given by the arc tangent uh, intended as the four quadrant version of what? Of B over A, so the imaginary part over the real part of G. Okay, so, so, So the passage I forgot there is that uh, G of J omega is a complex number. A complex number can be expressed as uh, its polar form, which is just E at the J omega again uh, times phi. So, so yes, this is a very important result. Um, I get it that it's not nice to go through it in the last five minutes, but what did we just see? We saw that if you send a sine wave as an input to a system, a linear time invariant system, a sine wave at a given frequency that you get to choose, the output of the system will be a sine wave that is just the same sine wave at the same frequency, but scaled in magnitude and delayed in phase, and change, or phase and magnitude change. 
and the magnitude and the phase changes are explicit functions of the transfer function evaluated at that specific frequency. G evaluated at J omega. What does this mean? It means that if we were to know this whole G of J omega function in both magnitude and phase, we would know that any sine wave that we send to a signal, as long as we wait the steady state, we know exactly what the, we can predict exactly what the output is. Actually, this whole argument is used in practice exactly in the opposite direction. Suppose I give you something, you don't know how it works. Okay, you want to reverse engineer something. Well, just send an input that is a sine wave. Wait for a while, if the system you want to approximate it as linear, you'll have the output that is a sine wave. Just measure how much the difference is in magnitude and phase, and you'll get exactly the transfer function evaluated at that point. Do it for a million points, you get the transfer function. Now you know everything there is to, it, to know between input and output of a system. We'll finish this next time. <laughs>